1 Timothy chapter 4, we're going to start by reading one verse, and then we're going to see a number of verses later on in the message. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 12, reading with me, please, uh, out loud. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. And today I'm going to continue in the series that I started last Sunday about the responsibilities that we have in our own local church as Christians. We have responsibilities. I'm not talking about mowing the grass and, and washing a window, cleaning the bathroom. Those are things that we volunteer to do. I'm talking about as Christians, as believers, what does the Lord want us to do? And I think today you'll be blessed by what the Word of God has to say. Now, Heavenly Father, I... I've already asked you this morning if you'll help me. And so, Lord, I'm asking once again, please help me today so that I can help the folks who've come. Thank you for our guests. Thank you for our people that are here normally. And would ask you, Lord, that you would use the message today. and Use me, if you would. I would certainly appreciate it, and so would they. And I ask it in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. The responsibilities of every church member, every person that's a part of a church. Today we're living in an age when the local church has been so put down. And, and, and that's, if that's the direction that the world wants to go, that's just not the direction that I'm going to go. I got saved in church. I got baptized in church. I dedicated my life in church. I've had pastors my entire life from the time I was a kid. And I love, I love the local church, but I think that sometimes we get used to being in places like being in church, and we don't take our responsibilities as important as we ought to. And so today I want to uh, review just a little bit of what I said last week, and then I would like to give you another responsibility that we have. And in our last time together, we learned that our first responsibility as members of a good local church is, is our responsibility to live a holy life. Not a sinless life, but a holy life. And there is a difference. And holiness has been taught in so many misunderstandable ways. The Bible says if we say that we're without sin, we make God a liar. So we're not talking about sinlessness here. But the truth of the matter is, I've been knowing the Lord for 58 plus years, and I should be sinning less, not being sinless, than I was a long time ago. You learn to do things and learn obedience to the Lord. And so a life that is consecrated, a consecrated life, only unto the Lord. We've even sung about that this morning in our songs. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Uh, and we've lost that. And what I said, Romans 12, 1 and 2, no matter how old we are and no matter how often we've been in church, is still, it's still in the Bible where the word of God says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. The next word is holy. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, the only logical thing to do. And as I've explained this before, Romans 12, 1 follows Romans 1 through 11. And Romans 1 through 11 describe the mercies of God. The painstaking detail that God went through to bring salvation to us. And he goes through all that. And then Paul writes and says, I beseech you therefore. Well, my pastor taught me when I was growing up, when you find therefore in the Bible, you find out what it's there for. Therefore is in Romans 12, 1 because of Romans 1 through 11. Everything that God's done, he says, okay, now that you see what God did to save your sorry, sinful soul, he says the best thing you can do now is dedicate yourself as a living sacrifice to serving in gratitude and in love to the Lord for what he's done for you. And you think of all the songs that speak about what God has done for us. Our first responsibility as church members, as people of a local church, is to have a dedicated life that is uh, one that is consecrated unto the Lord. And if you have not yet decided to do that, listen, I was saved when I was eight, but I didn't dedicate my life to the Lord until I was 17. But I'll never forget that service as long as I live. Uh, Dr. Tom Wallace came to my home church in, in Indianapolis, Indiana, and he was from at that time. He's now, he travels around the world as an evangelist, but at that time he was pastor of the Beth Haven Baptist Church in Louisville, Kentucky. And he came and preached, and I, I don't 
remember the sermon that he preached, but I remember the decision that I made. And on that night, I, when he gave the invitation, I came out of my seat. I walked down. I knelt right about here where I'm pointing at the altar by myself. No one else was with me. Other people had walked the aisle, but no one was by me. No one was filling out a decision card. No one had their arm around my shoulder saying, what are we going to pray about, Danny? But I remember that night I said, Lord, you're not getting much, but you're getting all of me. And that night I wrote God a blank check spiritually. And I signed it and I said, you fill in whatever you want, Lord, just whatever you want. I didn't know what he wanted. I just knew that I, it's like Dr. John Rice. He was never called to preach, but he volunteered at the beginning. And later on, he was called and surrendered to it. But that night, I didn't know if the Lord wanted me to work in a bus route or work a sound table or be an usher or just clean bathrooms or, or, or mow grass or, or, or run a vacuum cleaner or play a piano or play an organ or sing or play my guitar. or what. I didn't know what God wanted, but I said, Lord, you're getting all of me. And I signed the check. And by the way, I've never gone back on that decision. Have I lived a perfect Christian life? Goodness, no. But I've never taken my decision back. I've never said I'm done. Wipe my hands. No regrets, no turning back. That was a good night. That was February the 9th, 1973, on a Friday night that I did that. And I'm so glad that I did. And if you've never done that, you ought to. Because you have your life today because of God. You have your salvation today because of what Jesus did for you. And when he said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, and you did, he kept his promise and saved you on that day, Romans 10, 13. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And you did that, and he kept his promise. And then he made this promise. He said, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. He which began a good work and you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He kept his end of that. And so that's what it was about last week. The first responsibility we have is, is to have a dedicated, consecrated, surrendered life to the Lord for whatever he wants. It's not the big job or the small job. It's any job. Whatever God has for you, that's important. And remember this, there are no little jobs in the work of the Lord. It's all big stuff, and it doesn't matter what it is. It's all big stuff. Uh, one of the biggest things that I ever did in this church was when our weed eater out here wouldn't start. I went out and tightened the spark plug. <laughs> it was loose. And I, I tightened it by hand. That's how loose it was. You say, was that a big job? You better believe it was, especially for trimming the weeds. There are no small jobs in the Lord's work. My pastor, when he went to Bible college down in Texas, he said that as they, on the weekends, they would go out on an extension ministry and they would serve in a church. And what he did was on the weekends, he pastored a church in a little, tech, in a little church in Texas. And when the teacher asked them what they did over the weekend, he raised his hand and he gave his information. He says, well, he says, I, uh, he says, I pastor this little church over in such and such. And the teacher stopped him dead in his tracks and rebuked him in front of all the students. He says, there are no little churches. There are no little jobs. You know, it takes dedication. When we came to, to this church in this little town, when we were first of all in Woodland Park, I remember what one pastor said to me. He said, I could never pastor in a small town. I said, what does that mean? People in a small town are chopped liver? And what does that mean? They're not important? Is that it? I think about how Charles Spurgeon got saved, sitting behind an organ in a, in a ladies' meeting in a snowstorm. And he got saved. And I said, why couldn't you ever pastor in a small town? He said, there's not enough people to win to Christ. And I thought, really? You've got to be kidding me. One soul is just as important as a hundred or more. So anyway, I want to go from that because it takes dedication. Somebody asked me the other day, why have we stayed here for 32 years? I said, well, there's two things you've got to keep in mind. Either you're called or you're crazy or both. <laughs> and I thought, yes, that's exactly right. And so today... We also have a responsibility to God in our daily life to live like a Christian ought to live. And that's the second thing I want to give you today, is that we have a, daily, we have a responsibility daily. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 12, I think this is one of the most famous verses that Paul ever gave to Timothy. And he said, let, he said this, to this young pastor who had a nervous stomach, who had some 
people in his church that were troublemakers because they were rich and they thought they had influence. And the Apostle Paul writes and says, let no man despise thy youth. Just because you're young, don't let somebody look down on you just because you're not old like them. And he says, but, he says, don't, don't let anybody look down on you. He said, but be an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, and in faith, in purity. He says, know something they don't know, live like they need to live, and be an example to them in every area of your life. Just because you're young, you don't need to sow your wild oats. By the way, you sow wild oats, you're going to reap wild oats. And so the youth is not supposed to play a part of your life. Just because you're young doesn't mean you have to be a bad example. In our daily lives, we are to be an example to others. And it doesn't matter how old or how young we are. And there are habits that Christians should not have. And there are things that you need to pray and get victory over so that you can be properly identified with the Christ that saved you and forgave you and gave you a home in heaven. Listen to this. We owe him everything, not just a little bit, but everything. Many years ago, Dr. Jerry Falwell, when you would send him, uh, when you requested it, you could get a little pin for your coat that said Jesus first. I, for years, as I was younger, thought that meant first thing in the morning, read your Bible, pray, get your day started right. I didn't realize that isn't what it meant. It meant Jesus first in every area of your life. At lunch, at dinner, at the job, at school, uh, while you're walking, at the store, it didn't matter. Jesus first in every decision that you make. That's why I don't have it on my jacket this morning, but uh, nine times out of ten, I will have that button on my suit coat, and I will wear that. And so, uh, hear me now, don't miss this. Being identified this way in our daily lives, we ought to seek to live like a Christian ought to live, a Christian life. You know, the word, you don't, when you get saved, that doesn't make you a Christian. It makes you saved, makes you born again. The word Christian is a descriptive you remember how the Bible says that 12, I think it was 12 years after the resurrection of Christ, they were in Antioch, and it says they were first called Christians there. And the word Christian means a Christ imitator, a little Christ, a little Jesus everywhere you go. They were first called Christians 12 years after the resurrection. They were, what were they called before that? They were called the way. They were called uh, believers. There were a number of different things they were called, but they were not called Christians until 12 years after. Now, why were they called Christians? Because they, because they exemplified the Lord Jesus in their daily living. And that's a responsibility that every single one of us has in our Christian lives, is to be that kind of an example. You see, you know, they, they remember years ago <laughs> when I was a teenager, that was back shortly after Lincoln got shot, okay? But I remember we would sit around the campfire and I'd play my guitar and we'd all sing, they will know we are Christians by our love, by our love. They will know we are Christians by our love. That's not true. We sang it and it was a lot of fun, but it's not true. They don't know you're saved by your love. They know you're a Christian by your dedication to the Lord. That's how they know you're a follower of Christ is that you exemplify the life that he gave you. New life in Christ, as the songwriter said. And as the Apostle Paul taught a young preacher named Timothy how to be the best pastor that he could be, he gave him this admonition. He said, Timothy, be thou an example. Be thou an example. But I'm just young. Paul didn't say be a young example. He said be an example. And by the way, what is an example? I defined the word. Here's what it means. And this is the way it's used here. Because example can be used in a lot of different ways. But the way that the Lord uses it in this passage of scripture, it means the mark of a stroke or a blow, a print like a footprint or a handprint, a figure formed by a blow or an impression. I remember when I worked with leather, you'd get those little, little hammer and that little thing that you'd make an impression in leather if you were making a belt or a watch band or, or, or whatever it might be. And then you would strike that and it would make an impression in the leather that stayed there. Or uh, maybe uh, someone would be uh, carving into a tree, this little aspen tree that we have out here. <laughs> My son carved his initials and his girlfriend at that time, well, hopefully his girlfriend, which never worked out. But the initials are still on the tree, all blown up now, 
because the tree has grown, and my son has too, and he's married and got his own family, but the initials on that tree are not the one that he married, but he made an impression on that tree that has stayed. That's what the word example means here. You make a mark in someone else's life by the example that you set. In other words, be a life changer. That's the way it's supposed to be. Paul admonished Timothy to live in such a way that his life example would leave an impression upon everybody that was affected by it. Their lives ought to be different because of him. And as, as a young preacher, and by the way, it doesn't mean be a good boy or be a good girl. It doesn't mean that. And it doesn't mean oh, be a good Christian. It doesn't mean that. It means the life you live ought to have an impact on every person that you touch. So Paul was giving great advice. And then he went on and explained it. By the way, there's, there's a song called Find Us Faithful. And remember on our 25th anniversary video that they made and that's on our website right now? And they had Jennifer Scow and her daughter Emily sing this song because we had been here for 25 years. And here's some of the words that go to that song. It says, may all who come behind us find us faithful. May the fire of our devotion light their way. May the footprints that we leave lead them to believe and the lives we live inspire them to obey. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. Where's that dedication these days? It's hard to find. It honestly is. Paul was not at only admonishing Timothy to be an example, but also to be faithful at his duty and his calling. And the apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians believers in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 2. He says, moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. See, there's so much to this. Uh, of all the churches that Paul could have written to, this one was the worst example. The Corinthian church was horrible. It's not the church you'd want to pattern your church after, and it's not the church family you'd like your children or your family or your wife or your husband to be like. They were so filled with worldliness and disobedience to the Lord. But I like what Paul said later on. He said, he says, but I have hope in you. He says, in other words, you're, you've not arrived yet. I know you're going to get there before it's all said and done. So Paul even said to them that the sins that they were proud of in, in Corinth said the world was ashamed of. That's an amazing statement. You, what you're doing and you're proud of doing it, the world is ashamed when they do it. Horrible church. But he, Paul told them the best thing you can do is be a faithful Christian. didn't mean these folks were unsaved. It just meant that they hadn't grown the way that they needed to grow. And so, what kind of an example are you? And I'll get to the meat of my message just in a moment, but what kind of an example, what kind of an impression striker are you in someone else's life? In the same sense that Paul wrote to Timothy, I am asking what impression for Christ are you making in the lives of those around you? Now, that's whether it be your friends or whether that be your family or whether that be the waitress or waiter at the restaurant that you're going to go to. What impression do you leave with them? Robin and I went, uh, where did we go? We went to a steakhouse one time. And my, my fork was, no, it was, I don't remember, my fork or my plate was dirty. You ever get a dirty fork or a plate? And listen, people throw fits over getting dirty stuff like that. Well, you just don't use it. But I always ask the waiter, the waitress says, do I have to pay extra for this? <laughs> I got more meat and more potatoes or more egg on my fork. Do I have to pay extra for this? Oh, I'm so sorry. And then they like crawl to you. Or I could throw a fit. I refuse to do that. That's just not a good thing to do. And so I say again, what kind of an example are you? If it weren't for a bad testimony, many would not have a testimony at all. And I remember what uh, Brother Spear taught me years ago. He called it a testifony. Not a real testimony, but a testifony, which many Christians have. So part of being a faithful steward of God is that of being a faithful example, and that is, are you followable? Can somebody follow in your footsteps? And so that's what I want to major on today, is the followability of our lives. The, you know, the Apostle Paul, today we're living in a time, oh, I, I don't follow men. Uh, I, I, don't fo I follow Jesus. You know, that's a real spiritual statement. But the Apostle Paul said, well, you follow me. As I'm following Jesus, you follow me. 
I like what Roger Carr said to me many years ago, sitting in a restaurant. He looked at me and says, Pasta? He said, I'll follow the pasta as long as the pasta follows the master. I thought, you know, can I just say this? Jesus ain't here physically. But we are here representing him. So we need to be followable in our testimony. And so, as the Apostle Paul wrote to this young pastor, he said, Let no man look down or despise thy youth, but be thou an example of believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. And Timothy's youth would naturally lend itself to not being a faithful steward. But Paul said, You're young. He said, You be faithful. You be an example. You strike an impression in people's lives that's going to change their lives because they have been with you. Leave a mark. I thought that was good. So I want to talk about being followable today. This is the meat of my message. All that was to introduce us to what our next responsibility is within a local church. Every person ought to be followable, no matter who you are. It's not the guy that stands in the pulpit or stands behind the lectern or is in a Sunday school class. It's not just them. It's all of us. Every one of us need to be followable. I remember an evangelist, Dean Blakeney, asked me one time, he said, I want you to write me an outline on, about being a youth director because our, our youth group at that time was about, 100 and, about 150, if I remember right, and we had camp and different things like that. He said, write me something about teaching youth. My first point was be touchable, and his eyes got about that big. He says, you mean you want people to touch you? <laughs> I said, no. I said, I'm not talking about that. I said, I'm talking about being real, being an example where people can follow in your steps. And he agreed with that. I said, you have to be real. You can't be way up here and have everybody else down here. You got to have a level. You're the leader and there should be some respect, but you have to be followable. So here's what he said. Number one, if you're taking notes, be followable in your words. Because that's the first thing he said. He says, be thou an example in word. Word here speaks of, uh, uh, of what we speak and how we speak it, you see. Uh, our speech should be such that becometh saints. And that's the phrase that I looked up this morning about that which becometh saints. It's only mentioned two times in the Bible. And each time it's about how we live. And one of them refers specifically to how we speak. Having that kind where we have, have a speech about us that becometh a Christian. Being born again. Having Jesus as your Savior. Like I said, I've been saved for 58 years. I'd like to think that I take on a little bit of characteristics about him, but I fail all too often. Your speech is that of a Christian, or is it not? Much of Christianity today has adopted the lingo of this old world around us. The Bible tells us to avoid that. And it doesn't mean you have to walk around with these and thous and holier than thou and all the rest. It doesn't mean that at all. It just means that your speech ought to be pure and it ought to be right, and it ought to be righteous. The way you speak to someone, whether it's speaking in anger or with an attitude and all the rest of it, yes, be angry at sin, but learn to love people. Much of Christianity has adopted that a lingo of the world, and we speak more like those around us than we do about the one who saved us. There's a story in the Bible about the people of God who they intermingled their peoples together, and it says you can't even understand it because they're half the speech of this and half the speech of that. I remember being with two of our teenage boys many, many years ago up in Woodland Park. As we rounded a corner, they saw a girl, and she was very pretty, and, they, and one of them whistled, the wolf whistle at her. I, st I stopped right then and rebuked both of them. I said, number one, you don't know that girl. I said, but what you just did is totally disrespectful. I said, because what you're doing is you're reacting to the way that she is dressed and the way that she looks, and you know nothing about this girl. And what you did was disrespectful, if not even Christian, to do that. They took the admonition, but I had to say something because it wasn't right what they did. Because Jesus is the word, we should be followable in the way that we speak about our Savior and the way that we speak to those around us. Being followable as an example in our speech, you see how important that is. But then he says, secondly, be followable in your living because he uses the word conversation. And the word conversation talks about our lifestyle, the way that we live from day to day. Be followable in how you live. And it's, a different, it's different than speech, but it includes speech. Our conversation is our daily living. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 13. 
where the word of God says, For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God. And He said, you heard about how I lived? He said, I lived a dedicated life to my religion, to my Judaism. He said, I persecuted Christians. I put people in jail. I had them put to death. I split up families. I did all of these things. But then he turned that zeal around and used it for the Lord's glory, you see. As an unsaved man and a zealot for his religious convictions, Paul caused a great deal of damage. But here's the thing about it. I don't like how he lived any more than you do. But he, well, Listen, he lived what he believed. Think about that. He lived what he believed. In other words, it was not a hypocrisy, the putting on of a mask uh, at church and taking it off in the world. It was a matter of his conversation was consistent. And by the way, that's what the word hypocrisy means. It talks about the wearing of a mask of all things, putting a mask on to cover up one thing. And the worst hypocrisy is not being something you're not. What it is is not being what you are. That's the worst hypocrisy, you see. Timothy needed not only to talk, <laughs> he needed to talk, his walk, and walk his talk. I remember our college president years ago, he said, your walk talks and your talk talks, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. It took me a while to catch that because I wasn't real smart then at all, but then I figured it out. My walk is speaking louder than what I'm saying, and it needs to be the same. That's why James chapter 1, verses 22 and 23 it says this, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. He's just a hypocrite. Then he says, be followable in your selfless love. He uses the word charity here. Someone said a long time ago, as human beings, we can never have charity. That's perfect love like God has. Well, is that why God tells us to have charity? Because we can't do it? What it is, charity is an unselfish love. It loves without expecting to be loved in return. It gives without somebody, you know, you owe me. I did this for you, now you do this for me. No, it just loves, it just gives. It focuses on the loved, not on the lover. And today we're living in a very selfish society. And Paul said to Timothy, he says, you just love these people with an unselfish love and they will learn to love you back. You learn to do that. Today it's tit for tat. Today it's, uh, I did this for you, you do this for me. Now you owe me. Okay, I watched your children, now you watch me. No, 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 no. You just do things. That's the way giving has become in churches. If you give God $10, he'll send you 1000 Really? Is that really it? Yeah, I give to get? No, you give to love the Lord, regardless. End of report, whether it's a penny or a thousand dollars, it simply does not matter. You don't give to get. And today we're living in a time where so many pastors, if you want to call them that, around the country on television and on the radio and in different ministries and all the rest of it, if you give this to God, he will give this back to you. That's the wrong motivation for giving anything. The truth of the matter is we just need to give unselfishly as we should. And the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 13 that charity is the kind of love that every Christian should desire to have. And if you read 1 Corinthians 13, you don't find anything that love is. Everything is what love does. Everything. It, you know, oh, love is this, love is that. There used to be a comic strip called Love Is. It was cute. And, uh, but, but the 1 Corinthians 13, if you reread 1 Corinthians 13, everything in there is about love does not how love feels. That's a misunderstanding. Because love vaunteth not itself, envieth not. I mean, it's got all these different descriptions of how it does something. And can I just say, see, love is an action word. Love is an action word. It can be a feeling, but it's an action word. Charity does this. Charity does that. I know that doesn't really fit the grammar scale to say it's, a, it's an action word because it's not a verb, but it tells what love does, not what love is. Now, one of the best ones in there is it doesn't keep a long list of wrongdoings. <laughs> of all things, you know, yeah, but you did this. 
I do this because this is what you've done. That's not even love at all. Number four, and I'll be done here in a couple of hours, so don't go away. Something else, we are to be an example in our spirit, be followable in our spirit. And what is this? This is your attitude and the way you display your faith in Christ. Something I learned a long time ago from one of my preacher friends, I had never heard it before, but you know what? It made sense, especially with the word. To be excited in your spirit is one thing. It's defined differently. The proper word is to be enthused, and the word enthused means to be filled with God. Enthused. Theos, theos, the Greek word. It means to be filled with God, and that's the way our spirit ought to be. You know, so many Christians walk around today with a cloud over their head with lightning bolts coming out of it. Don't stand in my way, you know. And uh, how are you? Oh, I haven't had my coffee yet. Really? <laughs> so it takes coffee to make you kind? Is that it? Uh, don't talk to me. I don't want to talk to anybody before 11 o'clock in the morning. I'm not a morning person. And you get these attitudes that come. Your spirit is displayed to other people everywhere you go. I'm sorry, I got red hair. Well, I'm sorry you have red hair too, but that's no reason to have a bad attitude. I'm sorry, I've got, I'm German in my background. Well, that doesn't give you an attitude. That doesn't give you a reason to be, uh, to be that way. It says, well, I was reared different. Well, then change the way you were reared. You know, you're an adult. You're not a child anymore. You can't blame it on that anymore. But our spirit is supposed to display the Lord Jesus everywhere that we go. They may not agree with you, but I, this is something else that I guess I learned a long time ago. But if people disagree, if they are upset with my, um, what's, how's, how do I want to state that? If they're upset with my position on what I believe, that's one thing. I believe the Bible of your salvation is by grace. If they don't like it, they can lump it any way they want to. But if they are upset at my disposition, that's on me. And I don't want people to be upset with my disposition. Having a bad day, it shouldn't be raining on your party. You know, when it says it's my party, I can cry if I want to. Well, you can, but my pastor said you learn to cry alone, of all things. And what we need to do in our Christian lives is make sure that our enthusiasm and our spirit expresses the Lord Jesus to those around us. In class, at work, and everywhere that we are. They should walk away from you thinking, now, there, now there's an individual uh, who doesn't carry their feelings on their shoulders. You see, many today carry um, with them a bad spirit. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a bad example when you have a bad spirit. And what do the children see in the example of your spirit? What do your friends see in the example of your spirit? They need to see the Lord Jesus. Number five, and I'll be done shortly. He says to this young pastor, he said, be followable in your faith. And this is not speaking of your salvation. Okay? Everybody here that's, got, that's saved got saved the same way by putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone, plus and minus nothing. But this is not talking about your salvation, even though the Bible says you are saved by grace through faith. This speaks of our example in trusting God and in our faithfulness to him. Many Christians today are fine as long as the bills are paid and the gas in the car and the oil has been changed and the doctor said you're okay and you're healthy. But boy, let something go wrong and suddenly their whole entire world falls completely apart. See, pastor, have you ever seen that? <laughs> well, yeah. I've seen it many times. I mean, all, and everything's fine. As long as the cabinets are full, not a problem at all. What are we going to do? There's only one can of tomato soup left, you know. And we don't have any crackers. And what are we going to do? And uh, I remember my dad was telling me years ago that he worked for Kroger Bakery for 39 and a half years and then retired. Of course, he's in heaven now. And my dad said that they invested part of his money in the stocks. That's just what many companies do. They invest part of your paycheck in a stock. My dad at one time, I, I think it was either 20, I think it was $20,000 that he had in stocks that he'd never touched. He didn't do anything for it. It was just there. The next day, it was down to 5,000. The next day, not the next week, the next day, the bottom fell out. Back in 2008, a long time ago, the bottom fell out of finances in America. Many people don't remember that that are young, but that's what happened. And I asked, and when people lost 401ks, they lost insurance, they lost everything. 
just, it was gone. Lady in our church lost all of her investment. I remember that. I asked a man, we were sitting in a restaurant one night and the family was there and I, because I knew that he had investments everywhere. I said, did this crash hurt you? He stood back and said, no, not at all. I said, why not? He said, because I didn't invest here. He said, my investment is someplace else. And I thought, you know, money is one of those things that's here and gone. And so everything's fine until the doctor bill comes. Everything is fine until the car doesn't run. Everything is fine until the smoke starts coming out of the tailpipe. Everything is fine until we, uh, our car is due for an oil change and we don't have money to get an oil change or we have to go to the store and we have to, we have to buy the stuff in the black and white label. Somebody wrote the other day on Facebook and said, you don't know what it is to be poor until you have to eat this. And it was a block of that cheese that they give to poor people. And I thought, kind of a, it's food. Someone I spoke with here recently, they said, all I do is rent. What a waste of my money. I said, no, it's not. I said, you're not investing in a home, but I said, you've got a place to live. He said, yeah, I do. I said, you've got a roof over your head? He said, yeah, I do. I said, you've got a place to sleep at night. You've got a warm place to live. I said, it's not a waste of your time. You're just not investing in a house, but you've got a place to live. And he looked at me and said, yeah. He said, pastor, you're right. And the truth of the matter is what we have is we have our trust. I like what I like what Job said. And I remember the first time I taught this, I, I remember that people cocked their head sideways and said, huh, I don't understand. Here's what Job said. He said, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. He did not say, I will trust him to do something. He said, I'm just going to trust him with the answer. I thought, wow, that's incredible. So they came to me after the service and said, Pastor, I don't understand that. What do you mean? I, I did, I'm not going to trust him to do something. Isn't that what we normally trust God to do? Yeah, we trust God to answer our prayer. We trust God to supply money, to supply health, to supply this, to supply that. No, Job did not say I'm trusting God to deliver me from my boils and from these three irritating friends. I'm not trusting God to do any of those things. He said, I'm just going to trust God. Whatever he chooses to do is fine with me. I thought, wow, that's incredible. And you know, um, one of the most frustrating things is, uh, is to go, well, I always say, if somebody said, wants to go out to eat with us, I'll say, order whatever you want. You know, I got 10 bucks. I can pay for all of it. <laughs> and of course, I'm joking. And I was with somebody the other day, and I said, uh, it's a hospital visit, and I had to take them out to lunch afterwards. I says, now, we're going to go here. I said, I don't want you to look at the prices. I just want you to order whatever you want. That's the rule. That's the rule. Yeah, just what you find something you want to eat, just get it. Now he was going to trust me to pay for it, which of course we did pay for it. Not a problem at all. That, but it wasn't a matter of that he was going to trust. You know, just whatever I said. He's just going to trust whatever I said, and I meant what I said. Now, what if God chooses? For example, I know somebody right now who's uh, who's just about ready to die of cancer. They are trusting God to heal them. I'm not sure God's going to do that. The attitude ought to be, my life is in your hands. I like what David said. Wasn't it in Psalm, was it 30 or 31? I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose track. It's 30 or 31 where he says, he says, he says my life is in thy hands. My, no, he, he said, my times are in thy hands. What did he mean by that? The word times there is a picture phrase that God threw into the Bible. I love his picture phrases. And the word times there means unknown circumstances. There are no answers. He said, my times are in thy hands. Now, what had happened to David at that time? He had disobeyed the Lord, and the Lord sent a pestilence, and David got sick, and he nearly died. He didn't say, I'm trusting God to heal me. He said, I'm trusting God with whatever he chooses. Whatever God wants is fine with me. And that's what it means here to be an example in your faith. It doesn't mean to name it and claim it and blab it and grab it. It doesn't mean any of that. What it means is, I'm going to trust God with his answer. Whatever he chooses is going to be fine with me. What if he gives me health? That's wonderful. What if he gives me to where I'm not going to have the health that I need? That's fine too. That's whatever God wants because he knows what's best. What is the, what is the famous phrase? God loves me and wants what's best for me. God knows me and knows what's best for me. 
and God is all powerful and he can do what's best for me. And we let him choose. The little boy went into the store with his dad one day, and his dad's old country store down in Tennessee. And they're walking up to the counter, and dad's getting ready to pay for the bread and all the rest of it. And, and uh, the guy behind the counter, there's a big old bowl of fresh picked cherries. Now, that's a treat. Fresh cherries. And the guy behind the counter looked at the little boy, and he says, get, reach in there and get you a handful of them cherries. The little boy. And he said, no, go ahead, it's okay. Just reach in there and get you a handful of cherries. That's fine, you can have them. He shook his head, no. His dad said, reach in there and get you some cherries. He's giving you some fresh cherries. Finally, the guy behind the counter reached and got him a double handful of cherries and handed them to the boy. He held his hands out like this and he got the cherries. Dad walked out and was ready to rebuke his son. He said, son, he said, why didn't you get you some cherries when he asked you to? He said, because his hands are bigger than mine. <laughs> he knew exactly what he was doing. Yeah, go ahead and, and make your plans. Just remember, God's got better plans. He may know what's best for you. In fact, he does. And then uh, what I'm saying is there's something to be remembered here is this. Faith is not merely believing God no matter what the circumstances. Understand this. Faith is not, I believe God. Like Paul said in, in Romans, I believe God. Uh, or I'm believing God to do this. I'm, belie I'm believing God to do that. No, it's like what Job said. He said, though he slay me, I'm going to trust him. So faith is not a matter of believing no matter what the circumstances. Real faith is obeying God no matter what the consequences. No matter what the con And okay, God, it's in your hands. It's in your hands. Lastly, and I'm done, he says, be followable in your purity. And it does not speak of the purity that God gave you when you got saved. This speaks of your daily living. You see, this is a matter of choice. And the same word is used in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, where it says, rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren, uh, the elder women as mothers, and the younger as sisters, all with purity. It's the same word that's used. It's a matter of choice. It's how you choose to live. It's not a matter of, when I got saved, I was made the righteousness of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. We we're made the righteousness of God in him. It's not talking about that kind of purity. This is talking about the daily choice you make about how you're going to live. And it's interesting that 1 Timothy chapter 1, or chapter 5, speaks of how we are to treat certain people. And the apostle Paul encouraged Timothy to set what was, to set an example in his life of living a pure life. And there's reasons, just things you don't do. And please don't judge me on this. I've given this as an example, I don't know, 50 times, but I just want to say it. I, I do my best not to speed. And a pastor said to me one time, you don't speed? I said, no. He said, ever? <laughs> ever? I thought, you got to be kidding me, ever? He said, why not? On an iPhone, you can, if you're hooked into someone, you can know where they are whether they're traveling. And I used to always, when I would see him on the road, because he let me be part of that, it's called Find My. Uh, when I'd see him on the road, I would simply send him a text and say, how fast are you going? And he's always speeding every time I send him a text. He says, how do you know I'm speeding? How do you know I'm going fast? How do you know I'm... I didn't know how fast he was going. I just asked, <laughs> just asked him how fast he was going. And he asked, the same pastor asked me, he says, why don't you speed? I said, well, number one, I don't like tickets. They can be expensive. I don't like tickets. It's not, not a good thing to have. I remember my first ticket. I'm glad it got expunged, but I remember my first ticket. He said, well, what's the second reason? I said, I'm a pastor. I have to be an example to my people of not breaking the law. He got real quiet. But the, and that's just a small thing. It's talking about moral purity. It's talking about practical purity. All these different things about our daily living, you know. I was, I was talking with a young person one time over at Bob Marvin's garage when I was there. And he was under the hood, and he came across to some long cursing streak. And then he looked up at me because he knew I was a pastor. He said, he said, oh, pardon my French. Why do the French always get blamed for bad language? And I looked at him and I said, French? I said, that was nothing but good old-fashioned English. And he said, 
But you know, think about that. My pastor said he was sitting with a pastor one day in lunch, many, many, many years ago down in Texas he was with him. And the guy said something about one of the women in his church and he called her a name. My pastor nearly choked on his salad when he said it. Excuse me? That was a bad example. And Paul said to Timothy, you be an example in your personal purity. Now, I'm going to bring all this to a close. So I want to ask you the question, are you a faithful example to those around you? I know you all are students and you're here from all over the country. I realize that. But you've got a sphere of influence. Everybody in this room has a sphere of influence. It doesn't matter who you are. I don't know where you're going to all be this afternoon. I don't know what store you're going to go into, what restaurant you're going to go to, what cafeteria you're going to be in, who you're going to meet. But you have a responsibility to be an example in your daily living. And that's one of our, that is one of our responsibilities as a church family, is to be an example. Not just, you know, being a good boy or a good girl or good this or a good Christian. I'm not talking that. Remember the meaning of example? To strike and to leave an impression, to leave a footprint to leave a handprint, to leave a fingerprint, and to leave that example everywhere you go. I loved working with leather when I was was, uh, younger, and I loved taking those tools and that little hammer. It didn't take much, just a little hammer. And you take that, uh, or maybe the shape of a shell, or maybe the shape of this, or a shape of that, or a little half moon. You know what I'm talking about. You've seen them before. And I remember taking that piece of leather that was smooth and taking that little hammer and hitting it didn't have to hit it more than once or twice and it left a lasting impression by the way that will last as long as that piece of leather will be here when I think about that that's what he said to Timothy you leave a godly Christ-like impression everywhere you go and on every person you touch so what kind of an example are you in the same sense that Paul wrote to Timothy I am asking what impression for Christ are you making on those around you Is your life a testimony or is it a testimony? Is it making a difference or it makes no difference at all? Our Heavenly Father,